Uh, if you would please join us, um, and we will sing, Blessed be the Lord God Almighty. chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, uh, Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. You know, we don't do enough rejoicing, I don't think. Uh, we we ought, to, ought to be happy that we're, we're in, in worship today. Uh, Paul continues, Let your gentleness be evident to all. Uh, we don't see much gentleness in the world today. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. I see a lot of anxiousness in the world today. And uh, th this verse really means a lot. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I pray that that's what happens today, that the peace of God uh, will transcend all understanding, but also guard our hearts today. Let that peace of God uh, really be evident uh, in your life as we worship together today. And I'm going to ask Justin if he would open us up in prayer. Father God, we pause once again to thank you for the many blessings of life. I ask that you would just lead us and guide us through this service. We thank you for the ability to come together and worship you today, Lord. I ask that you would be with Kent as he delivers our morning message. In your name we pray. Amen. Now if you would join us, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We'll sing all verses.
today that we can come together in this house and worship you. Father, we know that there are many that are sick, many that are hurting. Father, we just pray to be a missionary that we're here to pray for and the ones who are dead this morning. Father, we just pray you'll be with each person, each family, and each situation. And Father, we just pray your, your loving hand touch each one. Father, we come today and we come and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Father, we just pray that you'll forgive us for the fallen short. And we pray that you'll be with Kent as he brings us a morning message. That you have given him the words that we need to hear. And Father God, we just ask you to be the leadership of this nation, this state, this county, and all this church. Father God, lead us and guide us in the way that we should go. For it. And we come and pray. Amen. As we come to communion, I ask that you please stand and join us. His name is wonderful. <laughs> come to our time of uh, communion uh, this morning. Um, as some of you know, and, and some of you may not know, because we, we didn't really advertise it, uh, Heather and I had to uh, go out of town uh, briefly uh, this week, and uh, so I uh, sent a message to, to Janie asking if we could get the songs uh, early so I could get the PowerPoint done early, get my uh, sermon done early, and by the grace of God, uh, we were able to, to have all that completed before we left, and uh, on the way back, uh, Heather asked me, uh, did you remember your communion meditation? No, I did not. Um, I, I said, but we, 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 when we get back, I'll, I'll get that done. Uh, <laughs> in texting my son, uh, Clayton, uh, he just casually asked, Dad, did you get everything done, you know, for, for tomorrow? Because we didn't get back until yesterday uh, evening, about 5 o'clock, 5.30. And uh, I said, yeah, amazingly, uh, you know, the Lord, you know, just helped me get everything done before we left, except for the communion meditation. He texted back, said, well, you should have delegated the, that to somebody. And I said, well, probably should have, and I probably would have had I remembered. Uh, however, you can't delegate something that you don't remember. And... Uh, as, as I was thinking uh, about that last night, how the Lord actually did uh, help me prepare for communion this morning because communion is not something that we can delegate. This is something that is personal between us and God. It's not something that we can have somebody else uh, to do for us. And, and Jesus, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, uh, said, do this in remembrance of me. And that's what we come together to do, to have that personal interaction, to commune with God 
and with his son, Jesus Christ, this morning through his Holy Spirit. Would you bow with me and pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for this day that you have given us. We thank you for the many blessings of life that you bestow upon us. We thank you for the grace that you bestow upon us to allow us to get things done uh, that we need to get done. But more than that, the grace that you give to us to forgive us of our sins, the grace that you give to us in allowing your son, Jesus Christ, to go to the cross and die in our place to give us the hope of eternal life. Uh, and Father, we pray that uh, in this relationship that we have with your son, that uh, we will indeed not delegate it to anyone else, that we will commune daily, uh, hourly, moment by moment uh, with you. Uh, and we will always remember the love and the sacrifice that was made for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. seated. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, would you turn with me to uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2 uh, as we continue uh, our series and an encouraging word. Uh, how many of you have heard, or maybe you have said it yourself, uh, with everything that's going on in the world today, this must be getting close to the end of time. Uh, I, actually, I've heard that all my life, haven't you? Uh, you know, something happens, something major, an earthquake happens, <laughs> you know, and, and so I says, oh, the Bible says, you know, in the end times, the, you know, and, and, and we get to thinking, you know, uh, Maybe it's getting closer. Maybe it's getting closer. Uh, and the Bible does indicate that the closer we get to the end of time, that the more difficult it is going to be for the Christian. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 through 12, then, and he, when he said then, he was speaking about the end of time, you will be handed over to be persecuted and be put to death. You will be hated by all the nations because of me. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Jesus predicted that at, as the end of the world draws near, that our persecution as Christians will increase. Apostasy will snowball. Uh, you know, people will get sucked into the world system. False teachings will multiply. Temptations are going to intensify. Uh, indeed, as we think about everything that is going on in the world and has gone on in the world, uh, I believe that we are living in the era of the end of time and have since Jesus returned uh, back to heaven. Uh, and, and we will live 
in those days until he returns to the earth, as the Bible talks about that he will. Uh, at every turn, for 2,000 years, there's been opposition to Christianity. Temptations have intensified. We, we, we think that, you know, it's, it, it's bad now. Generations before us thought it was bad then, and uh, it just keeps intensifying. And, and more and more, every generation, more, more people fall in uh, to the apostasy of, of false teaching, and, and, and people are turning to cults and, and, and false religions. Uh, I don't know if you realize it or not, but uh, uh, Islam is actually the fastest growing religion in America today. Um, not Christianity. Christianity is on the decline. Uh, I, I believe that Christianity is the only true religion. And, and so any other religion is, is a false religion. And, and the Bible talks about how the people will fall for those false religions. Uh, in Luke chapter 18 and in verse 8, Jesus asked this question that I have often wondered myself. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When Jesus Christ returns, when we hear the trumpet sound, and we see the in the eastern sky split open, and we see Jesus, will there be any faith on the earth? As the end of time approaches, it is imperative that we as Christians... Learn to encourage one another. And that's why Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, is probably more imperative today than it ever has been. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. Now, I don't know when Jesus is going to come back. You don't know when Jesus is going to come back. The TV preachers don't know when Jesus is going to come back. Nobody knows when Jesus is going to come back. But we do know that every day that we live is another day closer to the time that Jesus is going to return. Therefore, we need to do what Hebrews tells us to do. Encourage, spur one another on. Uh, let us consider how we might spur one another on and encourage one another all the more as we see the day of Christ appearing. In, in the face of opposition, we need this encouragement. And, and that's what I want to talk about this morning. How can we really effectively encourage one another in the Christian life. And, I, and I'm not talking about boosting one another's self-esteem or, or, or stroking one another's ego, but how can we really encourage one another to be faithful to Christ? Uh, really, that's what Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians is all about. It's about encouragement. Uh, notice what he writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. Paul writes, We dealt with you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God. Somebody asked, how does a, a father deal with his children? And the answer came back all the time. <laughs> You know, sometimes we always, always have to, to deal with one another. Deal with one another in encouragement. Deal one another in comforting. Deal with one another always in urging uh, one another to live lives worthy of God. Now, as, as I looked at this passage this week, uh, I, I noticed several characteristics that made the Apostle Paul an effective encourager. 
And these same characteristics, I think, will help us uh, to boost one another as well. And, and, and somebody asked, uh, you know, how did Paul become such an encourager? And, and I think he learned from uh, the example of one of his companions early on in his missionary journeys. And that was Barnabas, whose name meant the son of encouragement. So as we are encouraging one another, we're also, as, as we're being exam, we, we are being examples of encouragement to others to be encouragers as well. So, so as, uh, uh, Barnabas was an, an example to Paul, Paul is an, an example for us today. And the first characteristic that I notice about the Apostle Paul was that he was compassionate. He was compassionate. Paul genuinely cared about the Thessalonian people. When he expressed his concern for them, he used material kind of words. Notice in the latter part of verse 6, continuing into verse 7, Paul writes, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. And then in verse 8, he continues, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you became so dear to us. As we go about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, we also ought to share our lives with one another. The first step in being a good encourager is to care so much that it's obvious. Is it obvious that you care? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 reads, God comforts us in our troubles so that we comfort those who are in, have, going through trouble with the comfort that we ourselves receive from God. So the comfort that we receive from God, we can comfort other people. One of the reasons God allows us to go through difficult times, perhaps, is so that it will make us more compassionate and understanding of other people who go through similar difficulties. Paul could encourage the Thessalonians to be faithful in persecution because he himself had been faithful throughout persecution. Instead of resenting or having uh, or instead of resenting having a bitter experience, uh, we ought to let that soften our heart so that we can be compassionate to others who go through the very same experience and reach out to them. Uh, as I have said many times, people uh, do not care how much we know until they know how much we care. Um, we need to make sure that people know that we are compassionate for them. Um, Paul was compassionate. The second characteristic that made Paul an effective, an effective encourager was that he was also perceptive. He was not only compassionate, but he knew. He, he was alert to the needs of the Thessalonians. Notice what he writes in verse 9 of chapter 2. First Thessalonians. Uh, Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. Paul knew that the Thessalonians were suffering financially. And so he did not accept a salary from them for his preaching because he didn't want to be a burden to them. Not only would they have to work extra hard to support him, but they would also have to answer uh, the questions of the skeptics that they were, uh, that, that were saying that Paul was exploiting them. Uh, so Paul, being sensitive to the situation, being perceptive, uh, he, instead of accepting a salary from them, moonlighted as a tent maker in order to support himself. Paul was a good encourager because he was perceptive. 
to needs and to problems of others. And, and for some, this perception comes with experience. Uh, those who have gone through uh, an experience can relate to somebody else who is going through a similar experience. For others, this perception comes from discipline. You know, they, they, they uh, train themselves to focus on the needs of others. Thus, we have counselors. Uh, still others, this is a gift. Have you ever known somebody that just, it, they just instinctively knew? It was a gift. They, they knew when you were going through a hard time and, and, and they could be there. But I think the most important source of this perception for us as Christians is from the Holy Spirit. When you feel that nudge of the Holy Spirit to, to check on somebody, uh, make sure that you follow through on it uh, because the Holy Spirit might be impressing upon you to call somebody or to write a letter to, of encouragement to somebody or, or, or just let them know in some way uh, that, uh, that you're perceptive of their need. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions and be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. We need to trust uh, the Holy Spirit. We need to be especially perceptive in that way. If we're going to be in good encouragers, we need to be more perceptive to, to the Holy Spirit nudging in our life to to do this or to, to do that. Listen to these familiar words again from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. There, there is something in that verse that, that, that really strikes me. And that is that if we truly have fellowship with the Holy Spirit of God, then we will do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility we will consider others before ourselves. In other words, we will, like Paul was, be perceptive of the needs of others and put those needs ahead of our own. Another quality that made Paul effective in his encouragement was that he was spiritually minded. He was spiritually minded. Let me draw your attention to verse 10 of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, where he says, You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you uh, who believed. Paul encouraged the Thessalonians verbally to live lives worthy of God. But more importantly than encouraging them verbally was that he inspired them by living the kind of life uh, that, that he talked about uh, in their presence. A lot of times people are tempted to think, hey, in a, in a world like ours, uh, that is so corrupt, it's impossible to live a holy Christian life. And uh, when I say holy, I mean complete. Uh, it's impossible to live completely by the Bible, a lot of people think. But when they see other people remaining faithful to the Lord, that's an encouragement. And so if we want to be an encouragement to others, we need to live a holy Christian life. We need to live it complete um, because people will look at us and say, if so-and-so can do that, then so can I. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, let your light shine before men 
that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We're not doing it to gain praise and recognition for ourselves. We're doing it to gain praise and recognition for our Father who is in heaven. A fourth quality that made Paul and an effective encourager was that he was persistent. Uh, notice what he writes in verse 11. You know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Our responsibility as Christians is to be persistent, just like a father is with his children, dealing with them all the time, not... not uh, uh, being wishy-washy, uh, if you will. Um, all the time persistent, continually consistent, never wavering. It's our responsibility to be persistent in our encouragement to one another, to never be wavering or wishy-washy in our urging of one another, to be continually consistent in our comforting of one another, just like the Apostle Paul did for the Thessalonians. Uh, we should be always encouraging one another. Uh, it is indeed easy for us to uh, uh, grow weary uh, when people say, um, you, know, you know, I've written note after note after note after note to somebody, and it just doesn't seem to make any difference. Or, or I've tried to boost them up for, for years and years and years, and, 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 and you know, there, there's just no use anymore. And it's true. Some people are draining. Uh, they, they need that extra grace. But it's worth the continuing effort to keep spurring one another on uh, to love and to good deeds. And that's why Galatians 6, verse 9, has become one of my favorite verses. Uh, because it says, let us not become weary in doing good. How many times have you heard me quote that? Let us not grow weary in doing good. Why? For at the proper time, we will reap the harvest if we don't give up. We will not reap a harvest uh, uh, in, in seeing somebody come to the Lord if, if we give up. Um, we, we, we won't reap the, the harvest of seeing somebody remain faithful in the church if we give up on encouraging them and, 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 and inviting them. Uh, we need to be persistent in our encouragement. So be compassionate. Be perceptive. Be spiritually minded. Be persistent. And there's one other characteristic that I think is very important about Paul that made him a good encourager, and that is that he was expressive. He wasn't ashamed to show it. He, he, he was expressive in, in showing encouragement to those who needed it. Paul took the time to, to write this first letter that we're studying right now to the Thessalonians to express exactly how he felt about them. You know, there's many times in, in which we may highly admire or, or respect somebody for, for doing something that they say or do, but we often neglect to declare that to them. We might tell our, our spouse, we might tell somebody else, oh, so-and-so really inspires me. I really respect so-and-so but we don't tell the person that we respect or admire. Um, we don't say it to them. Um, an effective encourager finds the time to seek out the person who has done something well and express it to him or her. Um, we might really like the songs that we sing in church, but uh, we often fail to tell the people that are responsible for it. Janie, Jessica, thank you for the songs that you, you do uh, because 
they're, they're inspiring. They, they, they lift us up. And, and, and when we sing new songs that, that, you know, makes us to think about the words that we're singing, um, we, we need to let people know what inspires us. Don't be afraid, you know, uh, to express it to the person who, who is doing it, not to somebody else. Uh, let's say it to them. Let's express it in a verbal way. Um, and while we're on this subject of expressing encouragement, let, let, me, let me share with you a few guidelines that I think will, will help us all become more effective in our encouragement. Number one, be very specific, just as I was just a moment ago as an illustration. Uh, don't, don't just be general. Instead of simply saying, oh, well, that was a really good Sunday school lesson, and I know we haven't had Sunday school in a while, and, and I miss that. And, uh, but that, don't just say that was a good lesson and leave it there. Tell them why it was a good lesson. Uh, you know, uh, maybe it was a, a part about controlling your tongue or, or, or something like that. Something that convicts you. Tell why something was good. Um, or, or if you, you know, say to someone, I, I've heard good reports about you at work, you know, what are those good reports? Let them know because that inspires them and it inspires them on to continuing and striving to be more uh, of whatever that quality is. Um, be specific, not general. Secondly, be genuine. Don't, don't make a joke about it. Be, be genuine about it. Romans 16 verse 8 says, stay away from those uh, who by smooth talk and flattery deceive the minds of naive people. We need to be genuine. Don't tell somebody that they look like the, you know, they're 50 years younger when they're only 40 years, look like they're 40 years younger. <laughs> you know, be, be, be genuine. Um, and thirdly, be balanced in the encouragement. Uh, Paul instructed Timothy, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. A good encourager is one who mix in rebuke and correction also uh, with encouragement. Number four, be alert to the people who are not in the limelight. Uh, be alert to, to those that, uh, uh, as a result, not being out in front doesn't get much encouragement. Uh, sometimes the behind-the-scenes people are the most valuable people, uh, but they are often the least appreciated or encouraged. Casey Jones, uh, former head coach of the Boston Celtics, was known for his encouragement of his team. But when somebody would do something really spectacular, uh, it was noticed by uh, Kevin McHale, uh, one of his players, that uh, Casey uh, would never say anything about that really spectacular play. So he asked him, uh, and Casey Jones responded, when you make a spectacular play, you've got 15,000 people cheering for you and patting you on the back. But when you need a friend the most is when no one's cheering. I like that. I, 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 I want to be that kind of a cheerleader. One who is alert to the people who aren't being cheered on very much. And I hope that you want to be that kind of person too because that's a way of encouraging people. Be alert. And number five, don't be afraid to write it down. Write it down. It's nice to have encouragement verbalized, but it's also nice to receive a card from somebody uh, and and they can keep that card and look at it multiple times. Uh, when they're down and nobody 
you know, really realizes it, they can look at that card or that letter and, and, and remember. Um, and finally, if you are going to be an encourager, do it now. Don't delay. Don't put it off. Because when we delay and put it off, what happens? We forget about it. It never happens. Uh, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've had the impulse to say something to somebody or to write somebody to encourage them and, and to compliment them, and then something else happens and I forget about it. I don't remember it. Uh, we ought to do as the country music singer uh, Billy Dean sang about all the way back in 1990, a song entitled, Only Here for a Little While. Gonna hold who needs holding, mend what needs mending, walk what needs walking, though it means an extra mile, and pray what needs praying, say what needs saying, cause we're only here for a little while. Hey, I stood singing songs and saying amen Saying goodbye to an old friend who seemed so young Well, he spent his life working hard to chase that dollar Putting off until tomorrow the things he should have done It made me stop and think What's the hurry while I'm running? I don't like what I'm becoming I'm gonna change my style I'm gonna take my time Not taking all for granted Cause we're only here for a little while Gonna hold who needs holding And mend what needs mending Walk what needs walking Though it needs an extra mile Pray what needs praying Say what needs saying Steel guitar in the band, that's what I said. So let me love like I'll never see tomorrow. Treat each day like it's borrowed, like it's precious as a child. Oh, take my hand, let us reach out to each other, cause we're only here for a little while. Gonna hold who needs holding, mend what needs mending, walk what needs walking, the it needs an extra mile, and pray what needs praying, say what needs saying, cause we're only here for a little while. Yes, we're only here for a little while. We're only here for a little while. So don't delay it. Don't put it off. Pray to what needs praying. Hold what needs to be hold, held. Uh, mend what needs to be mended, even if it means that we have to walk an extra mile. Uh, go out of your way to be an encouragement to someone else. Uh, now, before I close, uh, uh, there's one other thing that I see from this passage, and, and that is not only did the Apostle Paul, was he effective in his encouragement to the Thessalonians, not only did he encourage the Thessalonians well, but the Thessalonians received that encouragement well. I was once told, Kent, you don't know how to take a compliment, and uh Maybe that's true, uh, and it, it is it is hard sometimes um, because I I don't want to you know allow that to you know my ego you know uh, 
but but we need to learn to accept encouragement well. Verse 13 says, we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as word from men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Uh, have you ever wondered why it is that some people can hear a message and just really soak it up, but right next to them is somebody who who's sitting there and and, and they're just staring off at space. Uh, well, the answer is in the way that it's received. Hebrews chapter four, verse two says, we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Have you ever placed an empty bowl under a, uh, a running water faucet and, and, and notice just how the water just splashes all over the place. But if you put something of substance down inside that bowl, uh, it stops the splashing. Those who have something of real substance in their life, faith, when they hear the gospel, uh, they're going to absorb it. Uh, but those who are shallow and, and empty are just going to have it splash out. Uh, so receive the word of God uh, well. The Thessalonians received Paul's message by faith. They absorbed the word of God. They, they sought out role models. Maybe that's what we need to do. Seek out a role model. Imitate them. And that's fine. Uh, they weren't too proud to say, we've got some things to learn from other people. Uh, let's not be too proud to, to learn from, from those who have been doing this for a while. In fact, Paul continues in the last half of verse 14 and end of verses 15 and 16. You suffered from your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up the sins to the limit. The wrath of God has uh, come upon them at last. Did, did you catch what Paul's saying is happening there? The Thessalonians received the word of God from Paul very well. They allowed it to motivate them to do better, even to the point that they were willing to suffer. And as a result, Paul says, I thank God continually for you. You see, there's a kind of an encouragement that takes place when we receive encouragement well. We encourage the encourager. It's kind of reciprocal. Um, so it's important that we learn to receive encouragement well. Now, it's true that Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And I think that's something that I've always struggled with. And that's why people say, you know, when, you know, you, you don't know how to receive a compliment. You don't know how to receive encouragement. It, it's more blessed to give encouragement uh, but there always has to be somebody who does receive. And so the question I want to ask you this morning as we come to the close of our service is, are you willing to receive the encouragement that Jesus Christ offers you today? The encouragement of knowing that no matter what you've done, no matter what how you've messed up, you're still loved by God and he's willing to forgive you of your sins. It's been said that there are two kinds of people in the world. Sinners who know that they need God and sinners who don't know that they need God. Well, the church is made up of people of the first. They know that they need God. They know that they're sinners, but they also know that they need God. John Bell, 
uh, was former president of the Special Olympics, tells about a 100-yard dash in which there, was, there were eight handicapped youngsters who participated. And they were running this dash as hard as they could and as fast as they could. And he said that they, their arms and their legs they were flying everywhere. Fifteen yards into the race, however, one of the contestants fell down, injured himself uh, on the cinders on which they were running. And John Bell said that in, 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 in that, the greatest demonstration of sportsman, sportsmanship that he had ever seen happened. He said the other seven, when they saw this one fall, turned around, came back, picked him up, brushed him off, and arm in arm, they walked to the finish line together. I, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but the Christian life is a race in which we are all participating. And there's times in which this race gets pretty tough. Uh, in fact, the Navy SEAL slogan may very well apply to us. The only easy day was yesterday. Um, it's tougher uh, today maybe than it ever has been um, with all the things that, that are going on. Um, but the church is not a place where we compete with one another. It, it's a place where we reach down and we pick one another up when they fall down and we brush them off and we encourage them and arm in arm we move toward that finish line together. It's a place where we spur one another on to love and to good deeds and all the more as we see the day approaching. You know, that's exactly what Jesus did he didn't come into this world to condemn the world, the Bible says, but to save the world through him. And right now, if you're not a Christian this morning, or if you're a backslidden Christian or a Christian who's stumbled and fell down, I, I, I want to be the one that reaches out to you and lets you know that it's not too late. The game's not over. The race is not finished. Uh, we, we can get up and, and we can lock arms and we can cross the finish line together. If you're ready to do that, if you need to do that this morning, uh, won't you come and meet me down here in the front as we stand and, and as we sing our invitation, which is All for Jesus, 368, and we're going to sing verses 1 and 4. Let's stand.
again, it's good to have all of you with us today. We hope that you were blessed and that uh, you were encouraged. And uh, I, I would encourage you now to, to, to go forth and, and be encouragers uh, to someone else because there are people all around us who need that encouragement. You may not realize it, uh, but once you encourage them, you realize just, just how much they need you, how much that encouragement is. Um, you know, while we were gone uh, to Kentucky, uh, uh, we, we met with our, our kids and had dinner with them. And I said something to, to Heather where I hope they enjoyed it as much as I did, or we did. And, uh, and she especially made reference to my daughter, uh, Marissa, said she really needed to be with her dad tonight. She needed that encouragement. And uh, sure enough, she did. Uh, and, and she let me know, uh, know that. And uh, so your kids may need encouragement. You may not realize it, may be oblivious to it. You might think you're the one who needs the encouragement, but in reality, it helps them as well. Uh, it may be your parents that need the encouragement. It may be a friend. It may be a neighbor. I don't know who it is for you, but be an encouragement this week. Always be an encouragement. Be like the Apostle Paul. Be alert. Pay attention. Be persistent. Don't grow weary in doing good. Let's uh, uh, close in prayer, and then we'll, we'll do our scripture blessing uh, once again. Uh, J.C., could you close us in prayer? Our Father, our God, which are in heaven, we come. First of all, we give thanks for this day, and especially this Lord's Day, when we can come together with part of the family of God to worship Thee in truth and in spirit, offering up our praises, Lord, to Thee. Hopefully, what has been done here has been good in Thy sight. Always remembering, Father, the words that Brother Ken has presented to us about encouragement one one another. We know, Father, that this life can get rough and it can get hard. We know with Thee and with the encouragement of others, we can endure to the end. We pray, Father, for each and every one. Those that are here, we pray that Thy blessings might be richly upon them this week. And Father, most of all, we pray for those who are not here. Father, we pray that as we go forth, that we might be a guide and light to others and a blessing to someone else's life. We pray for our nation, Father. We pray that the problems that we are facing, that they can make the right decisions, that it will benefit all of us. Keep us, Lord, in thy grace and guide us through whatever we may have to face this week. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Have a great week.